Our next speaker, Noel, has over 30 years experience in the food industry working in San Miguel packaging products, Magnolia, San Miguel Pure Foods, and Frabel before joining the Century Pacific Group. He brings with him a wealth of experience in the general management of companies in fast-moving consumer goods and business-to-business -business industries. Century Pacific Agricultural Ventures, Inc. Uh, operates as uh, CNPF's integrated coconut producer of high-value organic certified and conventional coconut products for both export and domestic market, some of which you've tried and we've consumed over lunch. So we're very appreciative that we are actually tasting the output of uh, probably your, the process that you're going to be presenting. So let's give uh, an imagineering welcome to Noel Tempongo. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, if I were a pineapple, I will be uh, two and a half tall. Uh, so I hope everybody can see me all the way from there. But I hope you, all, you also will not look at me as an overripe, no? Okay. Um, ecosystems thinking in food manufacturing. But be, before I go to the meat of my presentation, let me share with you a photo, a very old photo. Here, here we were 36 years ago during our graduation day having survived five grueling years in UP with no internet, no Google, no cell phones. While we knew the mantra, there is always a better way for IEs. For us, it was our early training in systems that became a difference changer in our careers, no? Systems. So needless to say, systems thinking Systems thinking is not the sole domain of the IE. However, my own personal observation is this. No? For those managers who did not have the benefit of systems training, parang it took them a longer route. No? It took them a longer route to learn systems thinking, holistic thinking, the hard way. And they were able to connect the dots between decisions they made and consequences of their actions to interrelated systems through sheer experience, sometimes making mistakes pa, no? So you guys, IEs, we have the benefit and this great advantage of learning systems thinking as early as possible. And because in our experience, you know, 30 years ago, no, or more than 30, 30 years of experience, like driving a car or riding a bike or swimming, systems thinking is a life skill. It is a life skill that I am guaranteeing you will give you advantage in your respective future careers. No? So for context, as it relates to our overall theme of food security, since I come from the private manufacturing sector, I will be citing examples which I came across with in my career, either directly or indirectly. So for the purpose of this presentation, I coined the phrase ecosystems thinking, which is a combination of the word ecosystem and the phrase systems thinking. An ecosystem is defined as a network of interactions among living and non-living organisms and between these organisms and their environment. Systems thinking is a perspective uh, it's a set of tools to understand a group of interacting and interdependent parts that form a complex and unified whole which has a specific objective or a specific purpose. Therefore, ecosystems thinking is the application of systems thinking and the holistic perspective in understanding, optimizing the output of an ecosystem to fulfill its purpose. Now, I hope to share with you some examples I have encountered in my career as applied in the corporate world, no? consistent with very, three very simple sis, uh, concepts in IE you are all familiar with. Number one, yung ating input process, output with feedback mechanism. 
framework, two, holistic thinking, and three, innovations no, for productivity, or there is always a better way. First, input process output with feedback mechanism, the sardines industry. The sardines industry's main input is a, is a species called the tamban. No? The, the Philippines produces 1.43 billion cans of sardines per year. Siguro naman, lahat tayo dito kumakain ng sardines, no? This is the output no, of the industry. However, so the per capita is 14 cans of uh, sardines per year. But prior to 2011, uh, there was a threat to supply of sardines, no? Because of overfishing. Okay, so feedback. What's that? That's the feedback. And therefore, the authorities, by way of the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, implemented a ban no, on sardines fishing three months every year since 2011. No? In fact, the ban is still enforced no, in, the area, in the main fishing grounds from Sambuanga to Holo, Sulu. The, yeah, so I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll show, you, show you this diagram. Can I borrow a pointer? Pointer. Anyway, very, very easy to understand. Uh, of course, from a manufacturer's perspective, if I were a manufacturer of sardines, I would like to maintain an inventory level good enough to serve my demand, even if there was a ban. So there is a, a uh, supply gap in my inventory level. I correct that. Uh, through my normal production scheduling, but I take into consideration that, that I have to build up. The good thing about canned sardines is that it has a shelf life of two, in fact, two to three years. No? So, the, from the manufacturer's perspective, um, the natural uh, uh, planning decision is basically to build up inventory so that um, the actual levels will reduce, reduce the su supply gap. Uh, of course, S stands, point, stands for uh, same direction, uh, and O is opposite direction. So, as you increase the production buildup, uh, it, it increases the actual level, which decreases the supply gap. F from the point of view of uh, BFAR, of course, they take care of the environment and the supply, the population of sardines. They also see a supply gap, but from their perspective, the correction is closing the fishing for three months every year. In fact, uh, very recently, the ban was made from December 1, 2017 to March 1, 2018. No? And because of that, you see the results in the su succeeding slides. No? The table... The table, the table here shows the effects of uh, implementing a three-month ban. No? The, bar, the blue bar shows the catch, level of catch per month before the ban was enforced. And the orange bar, bar shows the higher volume of catch after the ban was enforced. No? So you can see here that uh, the ban was, in, uh, was effective in terms of bringing up the supply of sardines, uh, because the, 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 actually the December to March period is really the spawning period of sardines. No? So they did not want to disturb the sardines while they were multiplying. So, however, aside from closing the gap in terms of supply and fixing the overfishing, uh, it also brought a lot of benefits to other interrelated systems. Number one, the, aside from re, uh, renewed supply resulting to higher volumes, the higher value species like tuna also increased in terms of volume because as the sardines level increased, the higher value, the bigger fishes also who fed on the sardines went back to the Sambuanga to Holo area. So that's one benefit. The other one is uh, even if there was a ban, it did not have an effect 
to the business in terms of the manufacturers. In fact, it increased their sales. No? And lastly, in terms of labor, uh, workers regain their income because during open season, they work overtime, but during closed season, they actually found alternative livelihood, which meant that on a net basis, actually, their total family income increased. No? So that is the, based on the study um, on social cost analysis um, by Rola, Nagit, Narvaez, and Cervantes. No? Now, this is one good example on how a total systems approach results in better decisions in optimizing the an output of a system. The next example is tuna. Let's look at tuna. To ensure the sustainability for the long term, no? responsible companies only purchase tuna from identified fishing companies that abide by ISSF standards or International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. It is a group of scientists, group of tuna companies. The World Wildlife Fund is also a member of this, and they promote science-based initiatives to make sure that sustainable fishing is promoted and uh, uh, practices that are frowned upon are not pursued. Of course, like the sardines, they also practice bans for certain periods of time in the tuna industry. There are two, three major tuna fishing areas where they are banned for specific uh, periods. This is Western Pacific, Eastern Pacific, and Indian Ocean. Now let's take a short video. Let's look at the short video of Greenpeace to show you what I mean. So let's look, watch this. FADs, or fish aggregating devices, when used with Perth seine nets, have disastrous impacts on the ocean's tuna stocks, other marine life, and put the Pacific region's food security and economic prosperity at risk. But visionary tuna industry leaders are moving away from FADs and instead setting nets on free swimming schools of tuna like it used to be done. One such ship is Frabelle owned Purple Lilac 888, seen here in the Pacific Ocean. It is one of 16 Frabel vessels now equipped to fish without fads. To encourage this move, the crew receives a 35% increase in their income when they catch free swimming tuna as opposed to catching tuna on fads. Using a combination of modern technology and ancient methods, the ship's crew and captain locate a school of tuna. They approach the fish and circle them with a giant purse seine net. The die and speedboats serve to confuse the fish and prevent them from escaping. The net is drawn closed and the fish are trapped. The net is hauled on board and eventually the fish are scooped from the net into the hold. Although some bycatch is present, the amount is far smaller than with Perth Seine fat fishing, which increases the catch of sharks and juvenile big eye and yellowfin tuna to unsustainable levels. Perth Seine fishing on free swimming tuna results in larger tuna being caught that can be sold at a higher price to processors. Uh, there are simply too many fishing vessels uh, operating and catching fish in the Pacific Ocean as, at this point in time and uh, their heavy reliance on fads and use of small mesh nets uh, only intensifies the overfishing uh, that is happening. As consumers around the world demand less wasteful and more sustainable fishing methods, forward-thinking companies are moving away from fad fishing and embracing solutions such as pole and line, catching tuna one by one and with even less bycatch, and fad-free fishing. The answers are out there, and the sustainable tuna fishing sector is growing and can continue. Let's go to the second IE concept, which is holistic thinking. The example here is the coconut ecosystem. Okay, in the, in the food manufacturing industry, holistic thinking is consistent with the concept of material balance. No, material balance. A material balance is a consideration of the input, output, and distribution of a whole substance 
along the production process, no? in between streams. Now, this is very important for a manufacturer because the manufacturer wants to make the most out of the whole input via an efficient conversion process, uh, and he wants to increase yields, efficiencies, and minimize waste so that the wastewater treatment plant is not overloaded. No, in, in, of course, sa mga factories natin ngayon, bawal na yung halos yung walang wastewater treatment plant. No? So, to make sure that the water that goes to the rivers are within government uh, environmental standards. So, if, if uh, your input waste is, is minimal or easy to treat, that means lower cost for the manufacturer. So this is very true in the coconut industry, the tree that is dubbed as the tree of life, okay? Because it's called the tree of life because of the amazing utility that you can derive from the coconut uh, tree byproducts. So the coconut husk, the husk is, is uh, the source of coconut choir, which is now used as coconut fiber to contain ero soil erosion sa mga bundok in the mountains, no? So, it's now very popularly used here in the Philippines, no? The coconut shell are used for charcoal, which is used for activated carbon, for filters, deodorizers. And uh, the flesh or the white meat is used for desiccated coconut, virgin coconut oil, coconut milk or the gata, and even coconut flour no? as a derivative of virgin coconut oil uh, processing. And coconut water, the one that we tasted over lunch, is a good source of uh, vitamin B and an excellent source of uh, daily potassium for potassium. It has, uh, actually, it has more potassium than a banana, you know, yung coconut water. It's good for hydration also and for the urin urinary system, okay? So a lot of prod products coming from the coconut tree. So you can imagine, this, these are uh, some of the images of the products that you can derive from the coconut tree. But if you can imagine running a plant, if you can make use of every bit of uh, byproduct of the coconut, then you can see that your, coconut, your wastewater treatment load is going to be reduced. In fact, you can uh, actually make more profits by adding value to each uh, byproduct that you generate. Okay? So, again, for uh, coconut shell, this, is, this can also be input for uh, boilers for biomass because of the high heating value of coconut shells. No? Okay. So, the next... The third concept is innovation for productivity. Sample is the poultry industry. No? Very interesting because uh, it's a fast-growing industry um, and it has evolved over time. No? You will see that over time, the industry has uh, reinvented itself through the use of uh, advanced technology in poultry raising. The amount of time to raise a fully grown chicken has substantially reduced from 1925 to today. No? This was brought about by a combination of uh, improved systems in terms of breeding. Can we go to the next chart? Breeding, uh, genetics technology, farm management practices, vaccination, feed formulation, biosecurity, and housing technologies. So, akala natin yung ating chicken joy madaling gawin, no? But it, there's a lot of thought and a lot of uh, technology that is brought towards gi giving um, good value or making the industry as competitive as it needs to be. And I will explain that later. The use of tunnel ventilation in chicken houses has, has resulted to the improvement over the last 15 years. So before, 
using regular housing to be able to raise a broiler chicken, it will take you 45 days. But now, because of proper ventilation, as early as 32 days, you can harvest the chicken. The weight at harvest before, at 45 days, was 1.2 to 1.5. But using tunnel ventilation, it's 1.7 kilos. The area before that you need to raise a chicken would be one square foot per chicken. And now it's even lower at just 0.55 square foot. So such is the benefit provided by proper uh, ventilation in chicken houses. Do, do we have the video? Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the poultry house of uh, Redu with a capacity of uh, 36,000 birds. The size of the building is uh, 50 by 450 feet. And the chicken is uh, very, very healthy. See? That's only around 17 days. There you go. Okay, dahil gininaw yung chicken, binigyan siya ng jacket. Huh? So, but anyway, um, however, you know, there's always a better way, di ba? Sa IE, no? So, even with these strides in poultry technology, where does the Philippine rank? Okay, this is where we start looking at our own systems based on a localized standpoint and how do we stack up against the rest of the world. As mentioned by Christine from Rustans, they are importing leg quarters. Now, why are they importing leg quarters? Magtataka ka, no? Ba't import yung Rustans ng leg quarters? Because it's cheap. No? It's cheaper. No? Because... Other companies are still more efficient than us in terms of producing uh, broiler ch chicken. Companies, uh, countries like uh, USA and Brazil, and actually within Southeast Asia, the benchmark remains to be Thailand. You know? the, the productivity measure is called feed conversion ratio. Lalabas sa ano? Lalabas sa exam to mamaya ni, ni, ni Ricky. Lalabas to sa exam mamaya. What is feed conversion ratio? Kung sinong gusto magkaroon ng power bank, you have to be able to, an to answer this, no? It measures the amount of feeds input to produce a kilo of chicken meat. Okay, you will see here that uh, the Philippines, in terms of farm productivity or livability, we're competitive. You know? But in terms of um, feed conversion ratio, we are behind Thailand and the U.S. and Brazil. In fact, in some literature that I saw, Thailand was uh, nasa 1.6 na in Thailand. Uh, but you will also see that in terms of cost peso per kilo production of dressed weight, we are High, no, we are high. Why? Because of uh, high cost of production, high cost of power, the usual um, cost inputs where the Philippines is not so competitive. Well, that, that's something that uh, I think government and the private sector has to jointly address. Okay, so from poultry, let's look at the last example. Okay, this is the last story and I'd like to share with you. In the mid-80s, 
And before that time, when you drink a bottle of San Miguel beer, unwittingly, you are helping uh, uh, reduce the number of trees <laughs> in the country. Why? Because Wooden Palace, during that time, yung panahon namin ni Elise sa San Miguel, Wooden Palace used, utilized a lot of lumber. So, in fact, between, you can see that in, in the 1980s, between 1990 to, two, to 2005, the Philippines lost one-third of our forest cover. And you can see the steep drop in terms of uh, our forest covers here no, in the orange chart. It's a good thing that because of log bands, medyo nag-stabilize na siya from 1990 to 2010. During this time, 1980s to 1990s, the beer bottles were sto stored in plastic shells. In the green, the green shells, no? lahat naman siguro kayo umiinom ng beer, no? the green plastic shells. Uh, we, we were in the, in the packaging business and we used to produce those very sturdy sh shells. Now, we were so proud. Ang tibay ng crate namin. No? It took years. It, it will take seven years before it breaks. But guess what? <laughs> we realized too late that uh, it was, it's not always an advantage. Uh, because if you make an unbreakable product, it will take seven years before they order again. No. So we had a lot of excess capacity in our injection machines. No. So the problems were twofold. First, there was an extreme shortage of wood. Uubos yung mga gubat natin dahil sa kahoy. And number two, there was excess capacity from the point of view of the packaging manufacturer. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the solution was uh, to create the first plastic pallet manufactured in the Philippines. It was an eight-piece plastic pallet, used the same injection machines that we had, and it provided as a good replacement for wooden pallets. So this was the product that we launched, and uh, the brewery actually was the first, the very first, customer who adopted plastic pallet um, technology. But take a look at the price. When we launched it, it was priced 2,400 per piece, and we could, while they, were, they, they can get, uh, they can buy wood at 400 pesos per piece. No? So how did we justify it? Plastic pallets will have a life of 10 years, so 240 per year versus uh, two years of wood, about 200 pesos per year. But we realized and we presented it to our customer that because of the varying sizes of wood and pallets, very inconsistent, nails protruding, it would not work with their automatic case palletizing systems. No? So if you factor everything, they saw the light. No? And to the credit of the management of San Miguel Beer, they bet on this. Uh, this is Mr. Tino Galang, actually, who bet on this. And up to now, if you see a beer crate, a beer truck, you'll see all of those pallets already plastic. Shootical. But the pl plastic pallets were very expensive. No? So what could be the solution? In 1993, the European Union was born, and there was a lot of cross-country uh, trading already between countries, members of the European, European uh, community, and pallet pooling was invented, no? pallet pooling. So pallet pooling is basically having a company that leases pallets. No? Because before, uh, once you approach Christmas, they will order a lot of plastic pallets, to serve their peak period, but after the peak period, there's excess, there's excess of plastic pallets unused. Okay, the beauty of pallet leasing is you just have to purchase your requirements for your regular cycle, 
but lease the additional pallets for your peak season and then dehire them if you don't need it anymore. So actually, those kind of models are really exciting because they use less input and they maximize utilization of capacity. Okay, so those are some of the examples of, uh, that I have come across with in my career. Uh, I hope um, you found some, something to think about from uh, this sharing. And in conclusion, again, ecosystems thinking is basically a perspective to adopt, no? As we want to convert in the most efficient way resources, resources that are given to us you know, by our good Lord. You know? As mentioned, we have a lot of abundant resources. In the examples that I gave you, I, we talked about fish, we talked about fruit, coconut, we talked about uh, trees like pallets, you know? and then we also talked about the birds in the sky or in the land or poultry. Now, those are gifts of the Lord. Those are resources given to us. So it's up to us as uh, IEs to make sure that they are converted efficiently, that value is, is uh, uh, created no? optimally, and most importantly, that it's a sustainable system, that we, we are not too greedy in drawing these resources and that we don't think of the next generation. No? So... Whatever happened to the group of young dreamers that I showed to you earlier, to these guys that you do not want to sit beside you in the UV Express, here we are now. Now, uh, actually, we, we feel, we feel, <laughs> we, we really feel very blessed, no? Because from this same Barcada who had nothing but our dreams in our pocket, uh, four, four of these guys have been recognized by the UP alumni engineers as outstanding IE graduates and alum, alumni of UP. No?